I thank you. Stacey Holman Jones and I wonder about the non-binary possibilities of leaning in rather than staying or going, about how bodies are both soothed and stressed by leanings and leaning in. How might a leaning become both an event and also an affective inclination, a moment of connection in which bodies come into contact but cannot be the same, are not the same. Different matters. The travel writer Bruce Chatwin talked about roaming. He said, if you walk hard enough, you probably don't need any other God. A real home is not a house, he said, but the road. And life itself is a journey to be walked on foot. I say bodies are a journey to, to be felt, not understood. This beautiful body keeps me moving inside and out. No doubt about it, my eyes crack open and the sun seeps in. Thank you. Are we going to keep it moving? Yeah. Oh. So there's been some excitement in the room. And I don't mean the obvious excitement of Dan's performance, which was stunning. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll come back to um, comments and, and questions and ruminations and, and blessings and things at, at the end of the session. Um, if I could now ask Joseph to follow on. All right. I'm going to share my screen. I made a presentation to go along with mine. That's great. Let's see. Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe. Um, my pronouns are actually he, they. I haven't been on Zoom in a while, so I need to update that. Um, my presentation is titled Queer Visibility Under the Sea, an Autoethnographic Exploration of Closet Epiphanies. It is about a series of vignettes where I had epiphanies and it was on my journey of coming out and identifying as queer. Um, I go to the University of Alabama in the United States, so it's a little early for me right now, um, so pardon that. But my research focuses on the lived and storied experiences of queer people in the rural South. Um, I'm interested in how our spatial environment impacts our identity at the formation and the construction of our identities as well. Um, I came to autoethnography after reading Narrate in the Closet and Autoethnography of Same-Sex Attraction. And my um, advisor at the University of Alabama is Dr. Boylorn, who wrote Sweetwater, um, Narratives of Black Women and Resilience. So she kind of got me into this. Um, I'm going to read from what I've been working on with this just every now and then. <clears throat> Writing may not fix the shame, but it may have given me the most important tool I have to live with it, a means to express the agony I carried for 21 years and the secrets I carry. A tribe of fierce and beautiful souls that not only know that expression, but who also aren't afraid of it. They aren't afraid of it. By extension, they aren't afraid of me. My mantra through this time has been, the only way through is through. Through is what writing about my experiences has given me a tool to use to get through. I framed my um, writing through music group theory. So what that is, is just how marginalized groups, oftentimes the discourse is dominant from the majority. So it's just a way for us to gain back our voice. Um, and also self-presentation theory. You're gonna hear a lot through my writing. I talk about my public performance and then the private dissonance that I experienced behind the stage. Um, a lot of the times I would really modify myself into something digestible for society at large, rather than listening to what was on the inside. <clears throat> Truth. As I begin writing, I'm aware of the stories I've kept secret for so long for fear of them being anything more than a sick, twisted dream. As a child, I was sexually abused by a boy at school. I held on to this secret and my queerness much into my adulthood, reflecting a dissonant view of myself to this day. 
I protected his senseless acts to protect his straightness back in my rural community of Nauvoo, Alabama. I struggled for years trying to end my life numerous times, seeking ways to numb the pain through substance abuse, truth. Graduate school pulled me out of a dark, dungy place where flowers refused to grow. Through writing, I discover how to use my truth and my experience to water the flowers so they can grow. Join me as I search for words to externalize the process, create new realities, and find healthier coping mechanisms for shame. These vignettes intersect as a singular thread to foster awareness and compassion for queer, non-binary, and other sexual minority identities. Remembering, telling, and retelling my story provides space to color outside the lines and illustrate the complexities of the Southern queer experience. Here, the layers peel back, truths are spoken, and people find resonance in the stories I tell. You'll see here I have mask off, mask on. <clears throat> mask off. My mama is an Avon lady, which means an endless supply of beauty products to dapple in while she's gone. Papa lets me create for female personas and model her clothes for him. He's an excellent auctioneer, but an even better America's Next Top Model judge. I learn all my tricks watching RuPaul's Drag Race late at night when my mother's asleep in the back bedroom. Silk, lace, wedges, yellow box flip-flops, knee-high boots. She's the kind of woman that wears a swimsuit top to mow the lawn and feed the cows. The smell of cheap hairspray, red lips, coconut moisturizer on sun-kissed skin. How do I look, Papa? He grins and gives a thumbs up. Scrunchies, ribbons, cheetah headbands. She cuts hair on the side and Papa, Papa shows me where she keeps her wig. When I can't find it, I improvise by taking the neckline of a shirt, placing it on my head and pulling my hair up with a rubber band. Am I pretty, Papa? Mask on. Mine and Papa's interaction show me he values my happiness over performing universal masculinity. At 11 years old, I only knew happiness. Retrospectively, I displayed many signs of gender nonconformity while also having my gender policed at a familial interpersonal level by my grandmother. In women's clothing, I would beam with joy and face threatening interactions took that wonder away. On the surface, I was searching for truth, room to breathe, room to grow. Papa tries his best to give that to me while also making me aware that my gender expression and sexuality will be questioned together. Our interpersonal interactions, as well as his reminder to save face when mama gets home from work, forces me to suppress my desire and view it as an abnormality. Boys aren't supposed to pay with dolls. Yes, ma'am. What I'm really getting at is, so the next part of the story talks about the experience of sexual abuse, um, the suicide attempts, and then when I had to spend two weeks in the psych ward. While I was in the psych ward, The Little Mermaid came on the TV. And I took back to my childhood and tried to remember how I saw that movie as a child. Um, and I think that as kids, we really hold on to lots of things in pop culture, um, especially things that seem mysterious to us, things that we can hold close to our identities that don't make sense. Um, playing with Mama's clothes made me feel good. We had the movie on a VHS tape and it was only ones mom could tolerate because there isn't much singing. As the youngest of six sisters, Ariel has an undying fascination with the human world, wanting to perform, perform the identity which aligns the most with how she feels on the inside. I watch Ariel perform a double life, hoarding an extensive trove of human artifacts and antiques, swimming to the surface to spy on the handsome human boy, Eric, while being defiant of her expected role as mermaid. Anderson, author of The Little Mermaid writes, she came to like human beings more and more, and she wanted to be able to rise up among them. Their world seemed so much bigger than hers, for they could fly across the oceans, on ships, climb high mountains, way above the clouds and countries. They owned stretched and their forests and fields farther than the eye could see. What would that look like for me to come out, to face my truth, to lay all my artifacts for the world to see? We internalize norms and reproduce behavior into something digestible for social legitimacy. I've always felt misplaced, misunderstood, confused, and it is these feelings which shape my queer shame. I fear being held accountable for misrepresenting myself, for not being authentic in interactions with others. After the movie is over, I call my mom to tell her about watching it. At this point, I haven't fully admitted to myself the significance of rewatching the movie, but by retelling it, I recognize this moment as foundational and epiphanous to disclosing my sexual identity and writing my truths. I just needed to find the right time. <clears throat> the next part was called break, um, Breaking Free. 
Before coming out as human, the sea witch offers her one final piece of advice. Tomorrow when the sun rises, I couldn't have helped you before another year had passed. I'll prepare a drink for you before the sun rises. You must swim with it to where your tail will split and contract into what humans call a nice pair of legs, but it will hurt you. It is as if a sharp sword will pass through you. Everyone who sees you will say you are the loveliest human child they have ever seen. You will keep your floating walk. No dancer can float as you can, but each step you take will be like treading on a sharp knife that made your blood flow. The day after Jamie texted me, Jamie's my abuser. I struggle in the mirror looking around at all the clothes in my closet. Flannel after flannel, boot cut jean after boot cut jean, combination after combination. Who is this person I see? Each outfit is a reminder of the mask I present. Thick tears well up in my eyes and I sit on my bed and look out the window. With each car passing, I reflect on the roller coaster of the past eight months. Mental breakthroughs, self-discoveries, suicide attempts and all. Each recollection ebbing from my thoughts like snapshots that shape glimpses and glances, evoking sounds of the car crashing, smells of cheap cologne and sights of times I towed the lines of consciousness. I can almost see the 13 year old boy crying in the shower, happiness washing down the drain. I can hear the boys teasing in the hall and the silence permeate through my body and sitting in my throat waiting for connections to be made. I feel a rise in my consciousness, cue aerial Oz. I enroll for my first semester of graduate school and take classes in communication and diversity, gender communication and intercultural communication. I'm here to learn about people I don't have access to in Nauvoo, Alabama, about people I don't, about me. In class, we read Hunger, a memoir of my body by Roxane Gay, and narrating the closet and auto an autoethnography of same-sex attraction by Tony Adams. There isn't a page in either book of, free of scribbles, pen marks, reflections, and highlights. Roxane Gay, formerly raped by her high school boyfriend, writes, I never imagined myself to be the kind of person who got a tattoo. My parents, I knew, would freak out because they were still holding on to the idea of who they thought I was. But my getting a tattoo was not about them. It was about me doing something I wanted and I chose to my body. With my tattoos, I get to say those are the choices I make with my body with full throated consent. This is how I mark myself. This is how I take my body back. And so I did. Before my body had been tattooed without my consent, every mark, scab, tear in the skin, and I've run out of band-aids, run out of temporary solutions. Over the next two weeks, I spent 24 hours at a tattoo shop and during an enjoyable pain, one that turns your skin over to someone else, but not in the way I was accustomed to. People often ask me my favorite one, and it's the first tattoo I got, a picture of two men with perfect posture looking each other in the eyes, reaching out for one another. It's representative of the push and pull between my private and public self, representative of the most authentic version of me, the one whose flowers wait to be watered. I relearned consent by tattooing my body. The next day, I take four trash bags of clothes to Plato's closet. They are a symbol of my old self, a symbol of the old person I want to leave behind. I thrift for months, querying my wardrobe, buying everything I had been so scared of before. High-waisted jeans, women's tops, platform loafers, prints, sweats, blazers, cardigans, anything my eyes are drawn to. <clears throat> anything to bring back that little boy, the one before the world told me who I could be. The way I dressed before was when I was afraid to wear my sexual identity on my sleeve. Although I wasn't ready to speak into existence, I was coming out to myself. Adam says we are straight until proven otherwise, and I turn to artifacts and adornment as a way of coming out in relational interactions. And this is how I ended it. If you see me wearing a crop top, you don't see me 12 years ago pretending to have a crop top by lifting up my shirt a little bit and my heart sinking to the bottom of my stomach when I hear somebody come home because I'm afraid I'm going to get caught doing something wrong. When you see me wearing glitter in the creases of my eyes, you don't see the time I was 10 and wore mascara to school but then went to swim practice. So I scrubbed it all off, hoping nobody would notice. But as I started swimming, the girl in my lane asked, are you wearing mascara? And I ran to the bathroom to cry because it felt shameful, like the shameful secret had been exposed. You don't see Papa stopping at the dollar store on the way home to get me makeup remover so Mama doesn't know I've been in her makeup again. When you see me smile, you don't see the countless hours I've spent confused, unable to pin down where the shame is situated, failing to name my experience as anything beyond gay guilt. When you see the confidence I radiate, you don't see the thousands of baby steps that it took to get here. I say this because I know how easy it is to look at a queer person and think, oh wow, I could never do that. I could never have that confidence. I could never write those words. And to my younger self, I thought the same thing. In Nauvoo, I was queer, I'm queer, 
am queer, but never lived in public as queer. It was impossible to go from where I was into what I am now. Impossible to grow into myself overnight. Going from never interacting with queer folks and identifying as queer is a big feat. Wherever you are on your journey, you can get where you wanna go, just not overnight. I had to give myself space, flexibility, and time to make sense of my experience. I must foster compassion to build the trust within myself to get more comfortable being out. If it takes you years and tears and steps back, frustration, scaredness, sadness, to get where you wanna be, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It just means you're doing it. Go at your pace. When I left to be the first in my family to attend college, Papa whispered in my ear, don't come back and slipped a $20 bill in the front pocket of my cargo pants. I think he was saying, go find that little boy again. Never had she danced so wonderfully. It felt like sharp knives in her fine small feet, but she did not notice it. It was nothing compared to the pain in her heart. I tell you this because we all have a voice that screams from within. These collective experiences are what forced me to start listening. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I'm sorry. Um, I just need to, to take a moment to compose myself. That was exceptional. Thank you. Guillermo, are you ready to um, to follow? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, happy and grateful uh, for this opportunity and uh, to participate in this in this panel. Uh, thrilled, actually. Um, I'm in my home, uh, my four-year-old is around, so if by any chance you hear some noises, my, my apologies for that. This is called Answering the Call of Conscious and Call Out Culture. In April 2021, close to 100 names were posted on Facebook and Instagram by a new community group based in Puerto Rico called Yo Te Creo, I Believe You. The names on the list, according to the Heather, belong to individuals, mostly men, who had been anonymously accused through direct message to group administrators of a wide array of sexual misconduct, including rape, sexual coercion, pedophilia, among others. Each Friday during a span of about five months, a new list would appear. At the beginning, many names uh, belonged to well-known figures in artistic, literary, academic, and progressive political sec sectors. The specifics of each individual allegation were never disclosed by administrators, nor did they refer any of the accused to police or any other governmental agency, nor did they offer any direct services to victims other than to say that they were in solidarity with them. Those named, particularly those well-known in their respective craft or profession, were duly hounded on social media, called on to confess, apologize, turn themselves over to police, resign, retire, and or die in no particular order. Some men did apologize in lengthy Facebook posts, though most denied the allegations and or threatened to sue for defamation. Nobody that I know of turned themselves to police. At least one person died. Seven months after their initial publication in an investigative article penned by Andrea Gonzalez Ramirez for The Cut, the group's administrators, without disclosing their identity, shared the rationale behind their actions. And I quote, we choose to believe people who come to us because statistics and our own experiences confirm that the probability that, the probability that these stories are true is extremely high. Gonzalez Ramirez does a good job situating the compilation and publication of Deep Weekly List as an ethically and politically fraught form of feminist activism in a social and political context where violence against women is rampant. She writes, and I quote, believing all victims is the beating heart of the project. This is not a space for questions about due process. Theirs is a black and white world, but the platform it itself floats in a sea of gray. Some big questions remain unanswered. Do the sources fully understand the risk of outing their abusers online? Should creepy men be lumped in with violent predators? Can organizers prevent the platform from being misused by bad actors? End quote. The list, of course, sparked heated debate amongst the same progressive political circles where abusers were supposedly free to roam. Group administrators defended their actions by referencing a well-known and proven fact. Violence against women in Puerto Rico is widespread, underreported, and poorly attended to by the police and justice system. The group's call was straightforward. 
we, the public, were to trust them in the way that we knew we couldn't trust police or the justice system. The list, in the mind of its creators, and in my mind as well, was providing an innovative grassroots alternative to attend to sexual violence on the island. I should point out, though, that group administrators admitted to not having any sort of protocol in place for soliciting or reviewing allegations. They simply published the name that was given to them by whoever offered it. On August 31, 2021, Jose Morales, a well-known and respected local entrepreneur and music promoter, hung himself. He was 52 years old. His name had appeared on the very first list back in April. But at the time of his death, he had been facing mounting pressure as calls for him to sever ties with the business he founded had gone viral on social media. Yo Te Creo, the group Yo Te Creo, shared a former employee's written allegation accusing Morales of calling her into his office and masturbating in front of her. Group administrators then spearheaded a social media campaign against him. Though he denied the allegations, he stepped down from his post. This notwithstanding, the online harassment continued. After his death, it was reported that his daughter was receiving online threats. The Yo Te Creo group distanced themselves from the event, claiming that a call couldn't call, claiming that a call out couldn't kill anyone. Five days prior to his death, Jose called me asking for help. I took his call, but I was cautious, which is to say, I felt myself holding back when offering him comfort, support. The reason was simple. My name also appeared on that very first list. In March 2019, a former student posted a video to her Facebook account in which she accused me of sexually assaulting her in January 2014, some eight months before I ever met the student when she enrolled in my class the following August. The video went viral, and although the university Title IX investigation not only showed her claims to be false, but directly pointed at the possible political motivations behind the allegations met against, against me, the harm was done. I've written about this experience at length in the article's autoethnography of the bad thing published in the Journal of Autoethnography and in the essay, I Can't Promise I Won't Tell, Notes for an Encounter, published in the digital magazine, The Autoethnographer. So I won't detail them here, but suffice to say, I recognize the desperation in Jose's voice on the other end of the phone. Jose and I weren't friends per se, but we had known each other for close to 20 years. By April 2021, when both our names appeared on the inaugural list, I had gotten used to seeing him on an everyday basis outside of our children's school. It was an encounter that took plenty getting used to, as he would shout my full name with glee upon seeing me. Considering that in the aftermath of the allegations met against me, I had been subjected to plenty on the street harassment. I would flinch every time Jose said my name out loud, worried that he was drawing undue attention to me and my boy. To be honest, it wasn't only a question of safety. I had grown wary of my name and of the sound of my voice and of my body occupying shared space. I was, truth be told, unsure if I wanted to live. With time, however, as I grew used to the sound of my name being called out like that lovingly in the street by another, I grew to love my name once again. This is something Jose gave me and for which I am grateful. However, I wasn't thinking of this when he called. I was thinking I should keep, keep some distance in case there was any truth to the allegations against him. I didn't want my name to be further associated uh, with a purported abuser. And so I took his call and I gave him all the best advice that I had sharing the small daily habits that had kept me up. And when he wrote back asking for the name of a therapist, I shared her contact information. But I didn't call or write to check on him, nor did I offer any other form of help or company or support. Five days after that initial call, he took his life. One of the main critiques made against autoethnography as a research practice is that it sacrifices critical thinking and theoretical insight for therapeutic writing. The question then, as it pertains to this particular piece of writing, is can I grieve here and work through my regret and my lack of action on behalf of my friend and still have something to offer readers in the way of keen social analysis and understanding? Ultimately, what I want to explore are the ethics of Jose's telephone call to me. Avital Ronel in the essay, Delay Call Forwarding and apropos Heidegger's dalliance with German National Socialism asked, and I quote, what is the status of a philosophy or rather a thinking that doesn't permit one to distinguish between the call of conscience and the call of the stormtrooper, end quote. Her question, in my reading, invites us to reflect on how thinking, 
what things we choose to pay attention to and what things we choose not to pay attention to always implies picking sides and opting not to respond to Jose's call to the extent that I knew myself capable of, to the extent that I normally would have. I was in effect choosing the side of those hounding, on, hounding him on and offline. In Ronell's terms, I was asked answering the call of the storm troop. The call of conscience, in contrast, was not Jose's voice on the line, per se, but the situation that provoked it. Another person was going through the sort of ordeal of which I had direct knowledge, and therefore I was in a unique position to help them. Whatever was going on with him concerned me, regardless of whether the allegations against him were true. It's not that I owed Jose for the kindness he showed me in lovingly calling me every morning by my name at a time when my name was synonymous with rapist. It is, after all, quite possible that he wasn't at all conscious of what he was doing. Rather, it's that in the recognition of how what sustains us can arrive in unforeseen ways, one must not let an occasion once recognized go to waste. One must not leave others at the mercy of whatever measure of kindness or support may or may not be offered to them after our paths have crossed. Thus, if there was a risk in my committing to being present and available to him, it was a risk I had to assume. To be clear, this administrators were on point in their analysis of the larger social political context in which gender violence, sexual harassment, and assault take place in Puerto Rico. They were right in that concerned citizens cannot blindly rely on or trust authorities. They, and they are, in the end, also right in their ascension that they are not responsible for Jose taking his own life. But insofar as they did publish his name under the banner of rapists, harassers, and child molesters, and in so much as they called for the boycott of his business, and in so much as even as he stepped down in the middle of the outcry, they continued to harass him and his family, Jose made a decision that, given the totality of the circumstances, cannot reasonably be termed unexpected or unforced, much less voluntary. It is true that my friend is not dead today because his name appeared on a list. He is dead because suicide is the one available path that a person may take when put in an untenable position. It is not the only path, nor is it by any means the best, but is the only one that will for sure appear in one's mind when facing such, such circumstances. The other, better ones that can appear, usually appear by virtue of our living with others. Somebody calls you lovingly by your name. Somebody answers a phone call and chooses to give you the best of what they have to offer, even if they are unsure that they should, even if it would come at great cost to them. This is the part, this is, the, this is part of what is often missing in discussions about the political efficacy and, po and potential for justice of call, of call out culture. It's an all too punitive strategy, not so because it looks to publicly shame and bring about some type of professional or personal consequences to perceived offenders. It is, an all too it is all too punitive because it keeps known and unknown others from, from, from fulfilling their ethical duty to those who have been called out. It keeps, it keeps them from reaching out to them, from following their instinct and or desire when called out for help. The offender gets called out, everybody around him gets called back reduced to onlookers, curious to see what path the alleged abuser takes. And then everybody can act, as, can act as if whatever happened to him had nothing to do with them. I want this short presentation to say that group administrators had everything to do with Jose's death. I want to say that my hesitance to help them also had everything to do with his death. More importantly, I want this presentation to say today that Jose's death was a tragedy regardless of whether the allegations against him were true. I want this paper to say that if I can show my face and say my name in front of you all today and share this story, it is in large part thanks to him. Gracias, querido Jose. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. Thank you, Pastor Nim, Susan. Um, so I, I appreciate we've all got a lot that we want to say, we want to think about, um, we'll, and we'll, we'll do that as soon as, um, as Susan's presented. So I'm just going to um, 
Slideshow underneath that little thing. Can you move that little thing? I can slideshow and you can't move it, can you? Can I ask about the hive map? Does anybody know how to remove this zoom toolbar from our mini map yeah, so that we can? Yeah. Another one. Another one. Yeah. Another one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the one to the left. That's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, just oh. right that. okay. And then you can find And then you can find it. Yeah. Just click on the beginning. So, then click, click on something. Oh, where's that going? Oh, that's the normal ones up there now. So I don't, I don't know. No, just get it there. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you, Dan, uh, Joseph, and Guillermo for such powerful presentations and so relevant. Um, and I particularly take on board that third presentation because mine follows on and it's almost like a counterpoint. So hopefully that will spark a lot of conversation. So um, my presentation explores the ethics of how I use autoethnographic animation to survive and subvert narratives of entrapment and oppression related to the trauma, both of my ex-husband's domestic violence and attempt to murder me and more specifically, my subsequent emotional and sexual abuse by two psychiatrists who I'll call Doctors B and S for now. And um, yeah. Philosopher Miranda Frickett terms the silencing associated with such experiences as epistemic and testimonial injustices, processes by which dominant groups suppress and silence less powerful groups, for example, by frightening or discrediting them. Um, my experience of these injustices intensified when I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and I was quite dismayed to learn that as trauma psychiatrist Judith Herman observed, this diagnosis is quite notorious and frequently used within the mental health professions as little more than a sophisticated insult. Herman described how people with the BPD label often evoke unusually intense reactions in caregivers, their credibility is often suspect, the frequently accused of manipulation or malingering, they're often the subject of furious or partisan controversy, sometimes they're frankly hated. And Herman warns that people diagnosed with BPD are particularly vulnerable to re-victimization by caregivers. And because I was re-victimized after my violent marriage by both Dr. B and I only really recover after I'd taken successful legal action against them, and thus I feel regained control over my own narrative. In Dr. S's case, the General Medical Council had uh, taken a case against him for sexually abusing both myself and two other women. <coughs> and at his tribunal hearing, which this, these two images uh, uh, result, uh, il illustrate, at his tribunal hearing, his defence barrister attempted to use my BPD as where he rhetorically asks who is or was in the day, which is me. And in the below image, near the end of the paragraph, he declares, we're at a loss to see how one could 
afford me there is anything other than someone who's deeply troubled, has been for many years, must inherently carry with her a degree of unreliability. Who, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, I was believed by the tribunal panel and in their view, I left the witness stand with my credibility intact. But I always wonder what if that barrister had succeeded in discrediting me as an unreliable fantasist? Would I have been able to survive that degree of psychic annihilation and what would that have led to? Alec Grant describes experiences like this narrative entrapment where people are held captive in the stories imposed by others or themselves and given diagnostic labels that more or less guarantee a future characterized by discrimination, stigma and being treated as less than fully human. So my own experience of this led to me using autoethnography to explore these dehumanizing attitudes. But I was dismayed when I encountered autoethnography to find some examples of that very same attitude within Tollock's 2010 paper, A Critique of Current Practice 10 Foundational Guidelines for Autoethnographers. Quoting Chang, Tollock dismisses women's accounts of mental health problems and abuse as everyday family stories. And he advises researchers against writing about what he terms these stigmatized experiences because he argues doing so risks shameful and career damaging consequences. But I think he fails to consider how survivors like myself and many others might experience this advice itself as silence and shaming. And even worse, in emphasizing that consent is paramount and should almost always be sought and granted even potentially in relation to incest, Tollick does appear to prior, prioritise the abuser's needs over the survivor's needs. Carolyn Ellis, in her 2007 paper, Telling Secrets Revealing Lies, adopts a more nuanced perspective, suggesting that it's the blogger who should decide what to disclose and, that, and when to seek consent. So in our jointly written um, 2010 paper, Struggling Tollickism, Alec Grant and I argue against Tollick. We believe his situation that survived, his suggestion that survivors avoid exploring mental health and abuse experiences and seek informed consent from their abusers itself causes epistemic injustice by constituting, reifying and reinforcing othering and marginalisation and thus compounding rather than reducing stigmatisation. So, I continue to believe it's important to challenge both Tollick and these situations, uh, as I do here at the Royal College of Psychiatrists Congress in 2017, where um, I spoke about these experiences and in response, a psychiatrist Simon Downer tweeted that my experience of psychiatric diagnosis and care is an important story for all psychiatrists to hear. And I continue to explore these experiences of narrative entrapment and particularly the emotional and abuse and iatrogenic addiction caused by Dr. B in my film, The Betrayal. And to further, or to really further explore and emphasize the veracity of my words, I, in the, the films made up of images from Dr. B's own clinical records and legal statements about his treatment of me that he wrote for the court. So effectively I'm, I'm actually using his own words, his own understanding of the truth of what happened between us. And I edited this together with light, blurred skin, a photo of Dr. B and my own legal statements in order to visually restrip my trauma through these evidential records. So I'm gonna play two minutes of the film now. Um, and just to be aware, there's some images of self-harm and flashing lights throughout it. And you'll also see that in it, I actually named Dr. B, despite not seeking his consent. And hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully I'm going to um, be able to play. Oh, sorry, no. I want to go to one particular bit of it. No. Hang on. I'm just going to play the first bit then.
Fourteen 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 Patient seriously assaulted by her husband. Patient attached to power. Seeks out dangerous relationships. Patient must avoid emotional entanglements. I urge her very strongly to avoid emotional entanglements. Psychiatric ward. I am your savior. No one gives a shit about me. So I'll just keep it there. I'll post a link to the whole thing online. Um, but as, as I said, I, I clearly named him despite not seeking his consent. So going back to that issue of consent, um, I want to conclude with this quote from a trauma specialist who saw the film. And in response to the film, she said, how marvellous it was to be able to tell the story your way and have so much control over which bits of the story you talk about and how you talk about the people in it. So this Dr. Brewer, I thought, yeah, Dr. Brewer, there's your name. There it is. So if you've done, there's your name on the film again and again, there it is in the film. And I just thought, so empowering, yeah, I hope she watches it. And she goes on to say, what you can see, which I liked, is it pulled the finger off and pointed it straight at him. And it kept pointing it straight at him, saying, this is all about you. It's a brilliant bit of calling someone out, I think. That's power. That's taking back power and going, you've made me feel like this. Now I'm going to show everybody. So. I did consult a libel lawyer about this film, and he said, because Dr. Brewer admitted to the events in his statement to the court, and I think that's really important, and also going back to what Diana had said, and because I own the copyright and I'm, I'm the publisher of the film, and I can back up my statements evidentially, I'm kind of safe from accusations of libel, but I'm more interested, especially what we've been talking about during this session, uh, from a relational ethics perspective in what people think about how I've named Dr. Brew in the film as opposed to, firstly, as opposed to Dr. B, as I called him earlier, which is what my college advised me to do in my written thesis, which of course I didn't publish, and I, I, I followed that instruction. But I do think that all too often author ethnographers are dissuaded from both anything that smacks of seeking revenge and from the presentation just before me of the consequences of the, the, the other way, tragic. But I think um, institutions can be risk averse. I think publishers can be risk averse. And, and, and I think Pollock, with his uh, Ten Commandments, has also influenced autobiographers. 
And in my opinion, all of these things do sometimes function as a further abuse for survivors who may have endured years of silencing and epistemic and testimonial injustices, and who I believe have a right to use autism or to, to call out their abuses by naming them, if that's what it takes to heal, and if there's a legal and ethical argument that, that can be made in favour of this. So, these are my references, and links to my film and website if people want to look at them later. So, thank you very much. I'm fine. No. Oh, yeah, should we? Yeah. Wow, what an amazing panel. Yeah, we're just uh, going to go back to those of you online. Oh, yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So stop sharing screen. Yeah. How's that? And then.